Welcome, well, everyone. Uh, we have the pleasure today to have uh, Raymond Daxel here as a speaker. Uh, he is a full professor currently at computer science at TU Dresden, where he actually also did his PhD in 2004. I didn't know that until now. <laughs> and um, after that, he was a professor for user interface and software engineering at uh, Uni Magdeburg until 2012 and has been, since 2012 then returned to TU Dresden and as as a full professor there now. And uh, Raimond is an expert in, in human-computer interaction. We've collaborated in the past, for example, on topics uh, concerning eye tracking, but uh, one, of his, one of his topics that's most dear to heart is multi-device interaction. So interacting with big screens and small screens simultaneously. And I think a lot of the things he, he will show us are, are concerning that. And apart from the multi-device stuff, Raymond also did a large body of work. Actually, what, 230 publications already? More than 230? <laughs> well, <laughs> in uh, InfoBiz as well. And we are very much looking forward to his talk now. Thank you for coming to us, Raymond. And uh, you can go. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> thanks a lot Ulrich, for the very kind introduction and thanks for inviting me. So the question of course is if there's any technical problem sound uh, if I'm not heard or if the video doesn't work so but it's at the moment everybody seems so yeah, uh, that is quite so on. there's no disturbance. It's about nature interaction for immersive data exploration and analysis <clears throat> and uh, before I uh, go uh, into detail, I'd like to quickly introduce my lab. So I'm heading the Interactive Media Lab at TU Dresden, and we are actually having two major foci of uh, attention in our research. One is human computer interaction, where we do a lot, as Ulrich said, with multi-device environments, with augmented reality, with mixed reality interfaces, and collaborative interaction. And the second is interactive and immersive data visualization. That means to interact with data, to explore data in, for example, mixed reality environments with mobile devices, as well as some um, uh, multi-device environments. I'll come to that later on in more detail. So to show on, on both areas, just in, a number of uh, screenshots, basically not screenshots, of, of pictures of our projects to give you an idea. Uh, about nature human computer interaction. For example, we worked a lot with tabletops, multi touch interaction on tabletops on the top right, for example, for medical education or for <clears throat> eye tracking on the top right, and as well as pen interaction, as you see uh, downstairs as well, uh, at the bottom, sorry, uh, at the bottom, sorry. And uh, then we have um, dealt a lot with uh, augmenting displays with augmented reality and also with interacting in places uh, with augmented reality visualization or outside it's not just uh, constrained to lab environments and also we built quite a lot of stuff for example this is some tangible use interface for learning music actually for chords and for um, yeah, uh, connections in the music and on the left, I forgot to mention that uh, this is our large uh, display wall we have uh, in Dresden in our lab and which can be combined with many different devices. With that wall, we can also do data visualization, as you see on the top, I'm um, sorry, on the bottom right. And this is some multivariate data, which is information visualization. We can also use uh, or did use mobile devices, also even smaller mobile devices, such as smartwatches. We also build our own smartwatches with interactive strap displays, uh, as you see here for visualization purposes. And we do a lot with graph interaction, graph exploration and also scientific data uh, exploration and visualization, as you see here with some microscopy data and uh, other 3D interaction. And uh, in the past years, we pioneered um, the combination of displays with augmented reality overlays, what we call augmented displays. You will see that later on in the talk with some more detail. So these are our two larger areas of research I wanted to quickly introduce to you and of course to acknowledge my team as you see here and the typical zoom setting as it is still common in these days and hopefully it will at some point um, finish and then um, I'm the Dresden speaker of the uh, Collaborative Research Center Sonderforschungsbereich Transrego CPEC Center for Perspectives Computing and also part of two classes of excellence Physics of Life and uh, Center for Tactile Internet with Human in the Loop. 
All right, just, I think data, I think I don't like this slide, but you know, data is everywhere. There's lots of data. And of course, you are experts on the computing infrastructure to work with that data. But I'm more focused on the human being. And that is to access, explore, analyze, and make sense of data is uh, what I'm concerned with. And um, of information or data everywhere. So not just in under lab conditions, as I said, but also in, for example, private spaces or public spaces. So the human being is at the center of my attention. And that is also what the attention of data visualization is. So data visualization, such as uh, graphs, as you see here, uh, several variants or other multivariate data. So for example, in information visualization, and of course, domains, you are more familiar with uh, scientific data visualization, such as volumetric data in medicine or biology or um, some streaming data and flow visualizations are important to show human beings to, to make them um, access the data and explore the data. So visualization, the depiction of information using spatial or graphic um, representation to facilitate comparison pattern recognition, change detection, and other cognitive skills by making use of the visual system. So I'm a bit advocating, uh, I think for most of you it's quite clear, um, to use also that human side of uh, working with data, obviously. And uh, visual analytics, just to mention that, because I also was asked to say a few words, uh, like more on the lecture style, um, integrates uh, these analytic data um, science capabilities, uh, which computers provide with the abilities of human analysts. So basically, you see that here in this nice, uh, very simple diagram <clears throat> by Daniel Kahn and colleagues. So on uh, basically, so a question, do we see my cursors? Yes, you see it, all right. So uh, this would be the typical like data mining uh, paths so where you can fully automize um, the uh, data analysis, for example, or pattern recognition, et cetera. So, and uh, this is uh, what I'm more concerned with. It's a visualization side. That means how to transform data into visual um, representations. And they are used by uh, people to um, gain knowledge, basically. And this interplay of these two worlds, the data science world and the interactive world, is called visual analytics and um, is a very promising approach in general. Of course, this is a typical computer, maybe a bit different looking, maybe you have several monitors. Most of us are still using at the desktop. And um, well, our computing devices uh, today are a little bit different and are more flexible, are more versatile and more um, widespread. <laughs> so a, a desktop computer obviously has a single person and it's just a single device. And we can go small with data visualizations, for example, going to smartphones and tablets, as well as smart watches, or even smaller. And we can also go large, like with our interactive display walls. And as Ulrich said before, the combination of these devices in so-called multi-display environments or multi-device ecologies is one of our research um, foci we have in our lab. And here, obviously, multiple people can work with that. So in front of such a large display wall, it's not just a single person who is um, analyzing data or exploring data. And this is uh, the, the other addition. If you go to the world, to reality, or if you simulate reality, or if you go to speciality, then um, we can, of course, have virtual reality or augmented reality devices as well, which can be, again, combined with displays to have um, a full picture of all these computing environments for future visualization. And of course, as you can imagine, with such devices, you can no longer use a keyboard. Like in VR, you could use a keyboard, but it doesn't make so much sense, obviously. Or in front of a large display wall, you can use a 2D mouse, but it doesn't make sense either. So we can use gesture interaction, for example, which is very promising. Obviously, we can use multiple fingers, we can use our hands, grow both hands, our arm, we can have food interaction, feet gestures, for example, head gestures, eyes can be used, gaze gestures, for example, even tongue, so I've um, uh, recently came across with a tongue interface, and so we can do tongue gestures, which is not super promising, but interesting, and then of course with your whole body, you can move your body. And not to forget about that, 
of course, to have um, devices in your hand and do like a VR controller, for example, or any kind of mobile device, which serves as a controller as a very promising way of conducting uh, gestures such as the remote, if you still remember that device. So what kind of interaction can we distinguish? We have, if we talk about surfaces such as tabletop, a wall, a tablet, we can have multi-touch input, we can have pen interaction and pen gestures, as well as tangible interaction. And maybe not everyone is familiar with that concept. So if you have a horizontal surface, you can put, for example, an object on that, like this bottle or so on the tabletop, and you can use it as, a, as an input, like uh, to, as an in dial, for example, or you can move it around, signify maybe a building or so in a map application. So and this is more tangible, more graspable, and therefore it applies to our sense of being more intuitive and related to the real world. Tangible interaction. And then of course, from the distance, like I do here, for example, or if you have a larger display, as well as if you're working, for example, in VR or AR, you can use gaze interaction, obviously. You can use proxemic interaction. What is that? It is um, using the distance of an observer, of a person, to display it, to interact with the data. For example, if I go a bit back, maybe I just see an overview of the data, and if I come closer and I'm tracked in space, then, for example, I get some zoomed-in view of the data or some semantic zoom, for example. Body gestures in general, so you can uh, use your body for gesture, uh, doing gestures, then spatial interactions such as moving a tablet through space. You will see several examples later on. And then, of course, the 3D controllers like you have with, uh, for example, uh, VR glasses and headsets, basically available. And then to not forget about the freehand gestures, mid-air gestures, uh, which you can use like very much like I'm talking, which of course have some problems as well. Actually, um, I can talk about this very long, so I can talk about it at least 20 hours in a row, So, because I'm giving a lecture on advanced use and where I'm dealing with all these um, interaction modalities, advantages and disadvantages, as well as um, applications, etc. So if you're interested, you can also contact me or look at our website and imld.de and check out our lecture videos, for example. All that kind of interaction can be summarized as so-called natural interaction. And natural interaction doesn't mean that we were born to, for example, use a pen for interaction or to do gestures, but um, we interact with uh, computer appliances by means of intuitive, oh, sorry, there's time here. Um, by means of, in, in means of intuitive, mostly direct actions which are grounded in real world, everyday human behavior. And nature, as I said, does not mean innate, but it's learned in familiar actions like uh, writing or scribbling, it's very familiar to us, which appear appropriate to the user in the moment of interaction. That's very important. So it feels just natural. That's the idea. Uh, and um, it's all these natural user interfaces are those which are grounded in our real world behavior. So we make sense of, for example, our understanding of physics, what, what means physics, for example, if I move an object on a tabletop, it should stop. So it should not go endlessly there, but uh, let's say if it is a document or I'm, um, uh, I'm aware of my body, of my um, skills I have with my body, for example, I can put my finger, the finger on my nose and I can do that with closed eyes because I have wonderful abilities <clears throat> and remember where my nose is unless I'm drunk. <clears throat> and um, uh, also the sense of the environment, the sense and awareness of other people around me in social awareness and skills are important in these nature use interfaces of the future. So in the remainder of the talk, I would like to give you research examples in three different categories, basically. So I would first like to talk about visualization in multi-device environments, <clears throat> then about with a smaller focus on mobile devices, and then the part on immersive visualization in hybrid realities. And of course, these things are not super uh, separated from each other. There are a lot of connections, as you will see later on. As I said, interactive surfaces are one category of uh, 
basically displays which are, can be used, such as tabletops, which are horizontal. And here we see a couple of examples for data visualization on tabletops. And um, interesting is an interesting modality, obviously, is multi touch. First of all, and you will think, okay, I'm using touch maybe every day on my smartphone, but I might remind you, you might use this the pinch gesture to zoom, but you are not really doing multi touch most of the time. So, most of the time, you're using a single touch. And this is just one example here visualization lenses which use um, multi touch. I hope. It works. So basically, this is a visualization lens, such as a magnification lens, which you can move around. This is still single touch, obviously. And um, you can, or local edge lens, which filters out irrelevant edges between two nodes, which are not really going through, or a K neighborhood. It brings together, it snaps adjacent nodes to the um, to the lens. And of course, you can you see that you do that in C2, you can use uh, uh, multiple fingers for interacting, and you can use, for example, uh, touch menus which are directly associated with such a visualization lens. So we don't need to um, to open a menu which is somewhere located at the side in C2, basically, in the sense that it is um, uh, at the place where the visualization actually happens, where the action is. And um, Yes, and of course, we have also the opportunity, if you are an expert, for example, to determine the type of lens, which is a zoom lens, as well as the major parameters, such as the magnification factor at once. And um, this just, yeah, just gives you an idea of that even there with a single device and with um, um, interaction with multiple fingers, you can advance. Um, your interaction by adjusting lens position size and the lens function as well as lens parameters. So if you're interested in lenses, I'm, um, I've developed quite a number of visualization lenses in my life and um, approaches. So if you can approach me and I also wrote a larger survey a paper on that topic. If you now think about larger displays, vertical displays, then obviously a the big advantage is they have more pixels and they have more space. And many multiple users can interact with these spaces. And we can also use other devices, more devices in combination with that. For example, you see here Ulrike and Ricardo holding a tracked um, smartphone in their hand to interact with the multivariate data visualization. By the way, this is crime data of Boston, um, as, sorry, not Boston, of Baltimore uh, for a longer period of time, so for 10 years or so. And it's, you see several views um, sourcing of these crimes, for example, um, uh, for, uh, according to the type of crime uh, or to time, and especially also the location where the crime was committed. Such large displays allow you to show either a single high-risk view, which is already stunning and astonishing because you see a lot, you can make use of the uh, huge number of pixels, such as uh, say map visualization, and you can show many data points um, at once. But you can also use multiple coordinated views, as you saw in this Baltimore example. Uh, that means you can split the space into so-called coordinated views, which um, show data from several perspectives and allow users to more directly approach a certain view, but also see an overview of everything. Third one is small multiples, and so we have scalability uh, regarding the number of variants. For example, you see maybe a certain data set developing over time, or you can compare maybe the brain uh, images of several people or uh, across several time um, instances. It facilitates comparison, and that's, by the way, a wonderful way where our human um, cognition and perception comes into play, because we can easily see differences, we can spot them quite quite easily. And then, of course, um, if you have large displays, you can also have distributed views. That means you can combine it with other devices, such as tracked mobile devices, as you see here, and then show maybe different perspectives, personal views, for example, to not disturb the others, which are also looking at the data. Let 
me quickly zoom into this example. As I said, <clears throat> this um, it was an analysis study we did here. So first of all, we carefully designed these uh, several views of this Baltimore crime data, and we wanted to find out, and um, it was our basic um, intention, how people collaborate and how they behave in front of such a large display wall when they have both available interaction close to the display by means of multi-touch, as well as by using a pointing device attract um, smartphone in the hands. We just see, we get a small video snippet here without sound, but just as well. And they, uh, they, uh, they talk about the data and they filter the data according to certain crime types, for example, and then they look where the crimes have been committed um, and then compare it With other data, I just forgot about the other data. And this, this is on the bottom, you see a timeline view of the data. So we have a great layout with different views of these 47 different perspectives of the data. So a lot of charts basically show all the data and bar charts, line charts, scatter plots, maps and no link diagrams. And this is a very interesting way of providing different perspectives in itself. By the way, this is a project which nicely shows how we work. We often use some unusual hardware or which not everybody has available. Then we design a set of interaction techniques. In this case, we designed a set, set of comparable interaction techniques which allow a transition from touch interaction directly on the display to distant interaction using some remote pointer, for example. And so that people are easily able to switch between these two techniques or input modalities, um, depending on their distance to the wall. And then, for example, you see this is um, data selection directly on the wall or by a remote pointer. So you use the mobile devices or remote pointer and have similar possibilities or details on demand, for example, you can <clears throat> just basically actually click on, on any of these bubbles and then get some extra information on that. And of course, if that works as well uh, locally, or you can have <coughs> rulers, for example, of course, you can also do that directly uh, using touch on the display, or you can use the remote device for that. All right, so we did a user study and pairs of users interacted with this data and had certain tasks to fulfill. I don't bother you with details, you can all read them in the papers which are available, just to give an idea how we work. For example, we have them, it's a qualitative user study, so we have a lot of observations. We, we sorted them, as you see here uh, on the top, sorry, on the bottom right, you see a lot of uh, comments sorted in two different categories, so it's quite extensive and complicated. And what we found out is that people often vary the distance to the display. So moving around, that was a very interesting comment, was a kind of activating um, my mind or activating the mind. So this is uh, this concept of space to think, as people say, found that out, that people make use of space and that helps them to organize their mind, basically. And they have a preference for overview distance and um, I don't go into all details. Collaboration is quite uh, smooth. Only few interaction conflicts were observed and they give instructions and commands are typically quite friendly to each other and they stand and walk close to each other typically so they're not so separate but try to accomplish the task together. And there's a preference for touch input on the large display because it's a bit easier than the pointing, but um, if you want to have a larger continuous interaction, like dragging something, for example, such a ruler, they preferred the pointer. Just another project, another example where we had some graph exploration tool using some tracked mobile devices, which in contrast to the previous example, um, show also different content on the device. Previously, we just used the, the smartphone like a, like a remote 3D mouse, but here um, you can see different- When content. near the wall, we use tap to select individual elements on the display. After selection, the role of the mobile device changes to a second screen for additional visual output. When aiming to select multiple elements, we support selection by encircling the nodes. Mobile focus view selection. 
We propose the use of a smart labeling technique that shows labels and information of the presented nodes on the wall size display depending on the user's position. For orthogonal pointing, only the position of the device and its orthogonal projection to the wall display is used. While this requires body movement in front of the display, it allows a flexible hold of the device and there were precise, more stable uh, I switched off my sound here at the at, at device and it still works. How does it work? This is uh, amazing. So I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what it is. Yes, we have the news check around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, selection on the display wall. In perspective mode, the orientation of the device is used to point at the display. The um, if I switch it off here, it should not work. Interesting. Okay, never mind. So you see, just, just I have just made it a bit smaller, yeah, not, not so loud yet. Yeah. Yes, it should be better now. Okay. Or using the measured distance from the mobile to the wall. With the distance to the wall, for example, the basic idea of proxemics, I was telling you. Selection on mobile device. For the selection of elements when far, the mobile device surface supports the same techniques as the wall. Anyway, stop it here. You see, there are several possibilities like what do I do on the wall? What do I do on this tablet? Am I disturbing somebody? Obviously not, if I have my personal view. And also this personal device gives you ideas like this one here on the right. You see that you can, for the selection you did on the um, node link diagram, you now see an adjacency matrix on your mobile device, which is quite cool because you have now a different representation of the very same data. And for as you see, she is uh, adding links or removing edges. And just by tapping on the appropriate cell, um, let me just show you again, in, um, on the adjacency matrix, it would be very difficult if you would drag, for example, a, a line, an edge, but here you just click on the cell and uh, just by means of the different representation of the data, you're able to fulfill a certain task, in this case, editing edges more elegantly than you would be able to do on the wall, just to give an idea of um, how interesting such multi-device environments can be. There's a very nice paper by Frederick Brody and colleagues about um, cross device taxonomy. Basically, it starts from what we have at our desk, typically some dual display or multi monitors and screens. And then you have maybe multiple mobile devices or even multi display setups, which then can be even cross device, that means across different types of devices, such as glasses and uh, maybe other um, displays, and can be even distributed. So if they are not uh, in a single location. So I don't want to go into too much detail here, just to give an idea of that there is, of course, also some systematic treatment of this field of multi-display or multi-device environments. And such a distributed system has, has, of course, a lot of technical challenges, for example, how to couple such devices. I did not talk about that. It's not super easy how to track such devices, how to synchronize all the application views, obviously. And um, then, of course, from an interaction perspective, you have to uh, handle with or deal with attention switches. Like you saw that here, they, they looked on the um, tablet and then also on the wall. Of course, this is a break in your attention. And then you have different input modalities. You have to deal with that. So it's quite an, an interesting space to consider. Of course, um, you can also not just apply uh, this to graph data or to multivariate data, as we've seen before, but also to scientific data or maybe to um, um, microscopy, microscopy data or maybe maps. And I just wanted to show you two different uh, examples here as a very short. On the left, you see the sleep display and on the right, body lenses. And there's a short video clip for each of them. So sleeve um, uh, is just an arm mounted display, as you see uh, on the top left picture on the right arm of this person. We just simulated it, um, uh, interesting enough, back then with a mobile device, as you see. But currently, I have to tell that we have a very nice OLED display, which is bendable, and which you can, I should have brought it with me, which you can really use as 
like it is, it looks exactly like on the top left picture. And it has a very a nice HD resolution still uh, and brilliant colors and it works pretty well. So what can you do with that? For example, you can have a lens function. That means only you see certain data on your mobile device. And this can, of course, be different data. It doesn't need to be the same, just zoom. But for example, here's some heat data or climate data at the point where the person touches. Or here you see some vegetation data where uh, the person touches a display. You see, uh, see it's different. And this is quite, quite nice because you have a wonderful combination of this um, large overview. It's a contextual view and the detail view on your arm, basically. It's also some older or body lenses. Uh, you see Ulrike here, for example, she is using a touch for directly working with a lens on a graph. And then you see that the lens moves with her body. So this is called proxemic interaction. And then she can also use hand gestures in midair to resize, for example, the lens for coarse interaction. So you see it's a transition between these three modalities, touch interaction, proxemic interaction, as well as um, free hand or mid-air gestures. So it's quite nice to see this transition, uh, what is possible, and poor Patrick, he had to stand there all the time and wait. <laughs> but you see, each person has their own personal lens and can even have the shape of their body. And talk about the distance, this is an example where you can map, for example, to the z-axis time. And so you can see how this building is a Chinese building, which was built in two days, um, uh, how this is uh, built. Uh, and, uh, and you can go back and forth and you can basically go through time, which is quite nice because um, yeah, it um, gives you this feeling of I'm stepping through time and you can imagine that for other data as well. We talked a lot about, about mobile devices, about uh, freehand gestures, about proxemic interactions or body movement, but we also build our own controllers sometimes because we are not so satisfied with uh, all the available controllers. And this one here is called Elasticon, or also Charm in a later publication, um, is an elastic controller like a sheet pass halter. So something you can drag out of your um, um, belt, basically, and it snaps back. And it gives you a um, kind of volume here, like it's like a, a joystick or so, and some additional handheld uh, mini joysticks or buttons or so for additional input modalities. is just an example of that. Of course, it could be any kind of um, stacked or zoomable information space. Yeah. Sharp. And, uh, Cord controlled haptic augmented reality see, menus. While head mounted AR displays are constantly evolving in terms of rendering performance, tracking accuracy, and degree of miniaturization, interaction with such devices, especially system control, remains challenging. Our charm approach. Windows. We contribute charm. A flexible <laughs> radial widget menu that makes use of the cone-shaped interaction space of our novel elastic input device and its degrees of freedom. Our fully functional prototype consists of a belt-worn, retractable handle that can be pulled away from the body and deflected to select menu items or adjust continuous values. The charm input device. The control handle can be smoothly deflected in midair that creates a body relative cone shaped interaction space. In addition, the handle can be pulled away from the body. Further, a tangible control handle at the end of the string and provides a thumb joystick, tactile push buttons, and vibro tactile feedback. The Charm Radial AR Menu. Okay, and then we used it for, for menu interaction, but I don't want to go into details. But you can use it for many things. It's a very versatile device and it works pretty well. 
These were a few examples, just a few examples of how you interact with large displays with interactive surfaces, which are combined. And if you look at to, in, a little bit into mobile devices, then we can you can also do cool stuff with mobile devices because um, we can, for example, combine uh, several tablets or smartphones and to delegate basically these different visualization views. We had, remember this Baltimore example, we had these 47 or how something or seven views on the large display. And of course, we can now um, move them to tablets, maybe not to 47 tablets, but a couple of them. And combining these tablets, um, we apply this idea of spatial interaction, of space to think, like his Andrews and colleagues, and the intelligent use of space. And um, for example, techniques like um, making use of the proximity of the devices or distributing overview and detailed views. I show videos in a, in a second, so therefore don't worry if you don't see all the details or alignment. You can, for example, use the alignment here to align charts uh, to each other, or you can show different views or generate additional views, etc. Let's just look into some examples. So um, to expand the visualization, so you see the, this line chart on the left is now extended and you have a larger display space. It's a simple idea of increasing your display space and that is one, one way of using that. Or you can rearrange data items. You have two bar charts and now you see on the bottom um, a difference bar chart between the two and the top there are the two aside each other and on the bottom you see a difference between these two bar charts, which were previously separated. So they are basically merged and combined to a new type of more intelligent uh, visualization. Let's call it like that. These are just example concepts to illustrate the ideas of proximity. Or overview in detail, say you have a, an overview on the top and you have two detail views on the bottom and you see this typical minimap views. So you see if you move that, then um, the other devices are uh, uh, changing their corresponding view. So it's a web-based implementation. I mean, we are often using D3 for the thesis or, and then of course for the 3D stuff you see later on Unity and other um, toolkits, but here it's uh, D3 and so this is quite easy to synchronize these uh, tablets. Or you can filter by viewport, for example, using navigation in one view to filter another one. That means you, if you drag the scatter on the top, uh, sorry, on the bottom, mix it up today uh, so often and then you see on the top uh, that only those uh, data points which are visible in the scatter plot and on the bottom are seen on the top as well all right just to give you this example this was called risk tiles and here i don't show you a video because then i'm running too much over time i just wanted to uh, tell you that you also extend devices such as smartphone um, as, sorry smart watch and um, strap bands basically these are now interactive displays so we um, devised a couple of different black and white and um, full color displays which are touch enabled and with that you have wonderful opportunities i only show a few of them here applications for example you can see some more detailed view here or this could be an overview or you can get messages for example even uh, tilted to your position where you currently look at or you see maybe root details uh, here the entire route of a um, navigation application for example or an activity tracker where you see some detail view here and an overview over time here etc so that's quite interesting and of course it's less important maybe for scientific data visualization as you can imagine but i just wanted to tell you with that talk also today that of course data is um, pervading our um, everyday lives quite a lot as well and so we need to find appropriate ways of also visualizing personal data and for that this is a good device so in the last minutes, I would like to talk about some immersive visualization, which also is in the talk title of today in augmented and hybrid realities. And uh, this is just a typical example of what we call an in, in situ visualization. So in situ for us is in the location of where the data actually was. Um, yeah, for example, um, Calculated or appeared here. You see an example. This is a visualization of uh, the points where, for example, the ping pong ball was hitting the table. Or here you see an example on a, in a museum exhibit 
where you uh, see the viewpoints of the visitors taking a photo from this exhibit. So you can see where is the cloud, I'm sorry, the crowd of people, where did they make pictures of and from which viewing angle. So it's in situ in the location where the data actually um, was recorded as well. So this was uh, not our work here, but just wanted to give you this idea of what uh, immersive analytics is all about. It's a use of engaging embodied analysis tools to support data understanding and decision making. This is a definition we came up after uh, one Dutch tool seminar and one Shonen seminar with many people in this book, Impressive Analytics. So it took us a few, few hours to come up with this rather simple definition. And um, basically what I wanted to say is immersive analytics combines the strengths of um, and a, and a visual analytics, as I said earlier, with typically some immersive display technologies. It doesn't need to be virtual reality. It doesn't need to be augmented reality because this feeling of immersion, this engagement or involvement someone feels actually as a result of exploring data, of looking at data, of analyzing data can also be um, generated by other hardware. Like for example, this body lens we have seen here, this you feel quite immersed. If you if you step through time, you have the feeling like you are in the data, even so we are not using stereoscopic or 3D images at all. No VR, no AR. All right, so immersive analytics is a quite interesting recent trend, and there's a lot of works um, popping up in this area. And um, it has opportunities because you have can, you can have embodied data exploration away from mouse and keyboard to more uh, nature, as I said earlier, interaction forms. It also facilitates collaboration. That means in many examples, several people uh, can work together and uh, can be more engaged in collaborating with data analysis. And this is what we call situated analytics. So that means uh, you have a linkage between where the data um, between the data and the physical world, artifacts where the data relates to, can be like products in a supermarket, industry machinery, lab instruments. So situated analytics is also another term related to immersive analytics. And you see a couple of examples here where you have additional information, for example, a displayed at a shelf in, in a shop or maybe a grocery shop or in a museum. I just jump over that for time reasons. And to show you a couple of last examples from my lab, Miria is a mixed reality interaction analysis toolkit, which um, basically visualizes tracking data of either people or objects moved through a room. So they were tracked before, and you can analyze uh, these movements or behavior directly in situ in the place where the data was recorded. Represent Miria a mixed reality toolkit for the in-situ visualization and analysis of spatiotemporal oh, interaction yes, data. With Miria, we aim to support HCI research in the fields of mixed reality and multi-display environments. The core of our concept is to enable the co-located analysis by multiple users directly in the original environment. We provide the tools necessary for the visual analysis of typical study data such as movements of users or track devices, interaction events and videos. For details, please refer to the paper. I think um, just go back to this image, you see a little bit of what you can do with that. And this is quite interesting. And it doesn't really matter what that data is coming from, where these trajectories have been, it can be simulated data, it can also be tracked data, as I said, and you can jump through several time steps and um, you can, uh, for, for example, switch on and off different trajectory, trajectories and uh, color code them. And you even have this is difficult to see. You can even generate heat maps on the bottom uh, or, or, or on the wall or any other surface you have been using. Here you see a bit better. So this is quite a versatile tool and we have a follow-up paper uh, presented this year at CHI where we even use avatar silhouettes. I didn't present it here just now. It's a collaboration with Autodesk Research in Toronto and which is dedicated to personal movement patterns and behavior. We all right, and then another example, we saw this these times before, these several tablets being combined for data visualization using this spatial um, proximity. 
And in this MARVIS project, we combine interactive surfaces with uh, some augmented reality overlays. And you can already see from these images how cool that can become because yeah, then you have some detailed view on the high resolution view on a tablet and then an additional aligned 3D view uh, on top. And we just look in um, rather to the video. I think this is so necessary if you see the video. Maybe Technical advances allow us to analyze data on a daily basis with the help of mobile devices. However, the limited display space can make it hard to keep an overview of several visualizations. In this work, we present Marvis, in which we explore the fundamentals and investigate the usefulness of combining mobile devices and head-mounted augmented reality for data visualization. Devices such as tablets show data visualization that can be moved around the table or can be arranged and combined with each other. AR, on the other hand, supports and extends mobile device visualizations by providing additional 2D and 3D information around, above and even between devices. We implemented a prototype application comprising six example use cases. The six use cases are scatter plot matrix navigation, node link diagram and attribute visualization, map navigation, non-planar slices on a map, scatter plot with 3D glyphs and trajectories, and combined bar shot with heat map and 3D stacked bars. In the following so scenes, which are captured with the HoloLens 2, we detail these six use cases. Objects and second, a more abstracted version showing highways and water only. The map can be navigated and data points can be selected text view which is shown in augmented reality around so you see the continuation of the a double tap invokes details on demand to also allow comparison of distant objects tooltips off move off screen to ar when panning the map the fourth use case focuses on spatiotemporal data and shows non-planar slices of data on a map for this we adapt an existing technique a 3d wall visualization can be constructed by selecting a path of neighboring countries here, the wall encodes unemployment data over time, whereby the height represents time. The tangibility of the tablet fosters literally picking up and rotating the 3D visualization for inspection. We realized further forms of aligned 3D visualizations on a tablet using a scatterplot as a basis. By selecting a data item in the scatterplot, the development of a data attribute is displayed for this item as a 3D glyph or 3D trajectory. Glyphs are located right on top of an object and show the change of size over time. Trajectories use the height above the tablet for an additional data dimension. Similar to the 3D wall example, holding and rotating the tablet helps to explore the visualization. Last the last use case illustrates the concept of combining visualizations using specific device arrangements. In this case, Bar shots show the number of enrolled students for either different semesters or study courses, while the heat map results from crossing these groups. Selecting a bar on one of the tablets will result in 3D stacked bars at the corresponding row or color. These bars then show the proportion of enrolled students in terms of gender and country of origin. In case of selections on both tablets, bars at the intersection are visually highlighted by reducing the width of all other bars. For more information on how to combine so this was the idea of augmenting um, tablets, which is quite an interesting approach. And of course, you can also now say, if you have such a large display as we have seen before with this Baltimore example, why not using that as well? And that's what we did. And uh, you see uh, on the left, Patrick and Tamara, and they are standing in front of this large display. They, have both, they are both wearing uh, augmented reality glasses. Um, so whole lens too, and uh, this allows some very interesting additions, 3D additions to the 2D data, which is uh, shown in high. We categorize them in techniques that mainly address issues with perception of data on large displays, and techniques that help managing density and complexity of data. Furthermore, all techniques also provide user-specific content using personal AR HMDs. With our first technique, we propose to display additional data on AR directly on the corresponding data object to minimize context and focus switches. These embedded AR visualizations extend orthogonally from the display and can be of any type or shape. They can either be toggled or be shown on demand with a tap gesture 
to ensure good readability of the original visualization. To reduce perception issues caused by extreme viewing angles and to support awareness for remote parts of the display, we propose to rotate visualizations in AR towards the user, similar to a hinged door. The larger the distance to the analyst, the more visualizations are rotated until they are orthogonal to the display. They hinge back towards the display as users step closer and ultimately vanish to reveal the original visualization on the display. Large, dense visualizations can be overwhelming and make it hard to identify patterns. We propose to use the axis of a visualization to show a corresponding aggregation of the data to make it easier to explore a visualization. These extended axis views can also be toggled, shifted and tilted by analysts to improve readability. To reduce overplotting or to incorporate additional data, we suggest showing additional visualizations of the same type in front or behind the display, allowing for superimposed comparison between them. Alternatively, a single dense visualization can be split into multiple layers stacked onto each other to improve readability. Analysts can change which layer is currently visible on a display by interacting with it. Behind the display. All right. Um, so, and what we have seen is, is what we call Marvis uh, on the top left, and on the um, top right, what we call Parvis. <laughs> no, not very uh, um, exciting. Um, and some more uh, examples, which I did not show to you on the bottom, uh, that's what we call augmented displays. It's the idea of augmenting any kind of um, small or bigger interactive surface with some augmented reality uh, extension and to align this appro appropriately and to use the interaction capabilities of this uh, interactive surface in combination with the three stereoscopic overlays of um, augmented reality. And this is quite an exciting area where I would like to continue working on because it, it's really promising. Okay. and. Now, the, the last uh, examples I showed you and then I'm soon finished. This is a very old work from 2011 when I started that. So it's just a projection on a tracked lens. So this lens is a sheet of cardboard paper, which is tracked in space. And um, the user is also tracked in space, the user set. And therefore you see this nice, um, it looks like stereoscopic, but it's not, it's, it's pseudo stereoscopic. It's just rendered for the viewpoint of the user. So it's distorted basically for another uh, um, view. This was uh, the beginning of that. Actually, it started a bit early even. And um, then later on, uh, we used um, in this video, we present our investigations on spatial interaction in comparison to touch for 3D data visualization with mobile devices. 3D visualizations have well-known limitations regarding perception and interaction. In this context, we examine the usage of spatial interaction to overcome these issues. We studied the potential of such spatial interaction for in-place 3D visualizations in comparison to classic touch interaction. Specifically, we were interested, which tasks can benefit from spatial input. How the physical space is used during exploration. And what the limitations of spatial input are. For the baseline of touch input we used an orbit camera model. The interaction with this camera model is described in detail in our paper. I stop it. I just want. I actually didn't want to go into detail because it's too much. I understand that, <laughs> and I know. I just wanted to show you the transition from this handheld a sheet of cardboard paper to this uh, tracked tablet in space, and um, to see. Um, this is a study where we found out for which task spatial interaction is better than, for example, touch interaction. And uh, then in, in a more recent work from last year. Uh, we used these tablets, for example, in combination with medical data to show us so this was a liver model in 3D space. So as again, augmented reality display, plus uh, you see um, uh, in this slicing application, the data, the MRI data of the, um, or is it CT data? I'm sorry, maybe, <laughs> maybe you know it better. Sorry for that, for this <clears throat> being unsure. It's CT, yes. CT data of the um, liver, and you can slice it basically, and, and you have always this context model basically around it, and you, see, you have several techniques of annotating this, for, as you see on the top right, for example, in figure E, and uh, yeah, 
uh, slicing it in various ways and bookmarking it, etc. And more recently, this is still unpublished work, we built a transparent tablet, which you see on the bottom uh, right. So this is a prototype which is touch enabled and pen enabled, pen input, and it's just a transparent uh, display, basically. And you can use it for um, interacting with data, as you see here with Katja and Wolfgang doing that. So such techniques, as you see, you can make annotations, not just on augmented reality, because that would not make much sense alone, or like in VR, for example, but especially in, in relation to the real world. So this is example, Katja and Wolfgang. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, so handy. <laughs> yeah, but this is a transparent table, so, so she can slice it and still see the context below and also see whatever the facial expressions of the person collaborating uh, on, on. Or here you see that, so you can interact with data and then have some uh, slicing views, as you see here, maybe additional views on the tablet which we can't see at the moment. You can also overlay um, data on the table or on documents or even 3D printed visualizations. Um, it's called a data visualization. <clears throat> you can interact with smart home appliances. There's a light bulb and you have directly overlaid a menu uh, controlling the color of this light bulb. It's a smart home light bulb or you may, might have maybe um, some humidity sensor in your plant and then connect it to the light bulb directly as well. I need this one. This is a, a very cool project and maybe, and of course, we had to build again some stuff, so it was not super easy, but uh, worked pretty well and has a high quality. And now, maybe you just uh, yeah. Or you can also write for them, you can have annotations in space and you can leave it somewhere in space and um, like messages to your friends, for example, or, so, or you can um, write directly on a desk, for example, as is, uh, oh, sorry, this is in space, sorry, I messed it up, uh, somewhere in space where the constraints are used of the tablet, it helps you um, restricting your uh, interaction a little bit, or you can write something uh, directly on, on on some surface which is tracked, and leave your message there as something like that. Or you can manipulate objects through the window interaction. And of course, it's difficult to see for us. It is filmed with an external cam camera, uh, so therefore it looks a bit strange. And if you see it stereoscopically, of course, it's very nice, and you don't don't feel that to be strange. All right. I arrive at the challenges. I could, could go more in detail. And um, so this nice paper is called Grand Challenges in Immersive Analytics. And just to um, let you know that, of course, there's still it's an early field, so there still need to be guidelines to be developed. We have to consider human perception. We have to think about human senses in general, um, what human senses are very well suited and which are not for immersive analytics. We have to support collaboration, this is very important, and also with interaction complexity. I think I showed you a couple of examples for that, and um, then also do more studies and evaluation. And what I, what's not in this paper here, where um, we are also co-authors of, is authoring a toolkit support that's very important, because this is often neglected, and of course I know that uh, um, I'm, I don't need to talk about this here in Casas, but because we have experts in dual support and um, just want to, to, to mention, sorry, that for example- To implement our visualizations and techniques, we created U2Vis, a data-driven framework for information visualization for Unity, which natively supports augmented reality applications. It can be configured completely in the Unity editor, is easily extendable and available on GitHub. So I think um, in general, we see a, um, a trend to, to our device ecologies, to more pervasive usage of these devices. Touch is not the only medium of interaction, also in other forms of natural multimodal interaction. And it's not just professional use of data visualizations, but also personal or casual use, which we can observe. And sometimes we just glance at visualizations, sometimes we dive a little bit 
more deeply. And of course, we are no longer just single users, but there are increasingly scenarios to be observed with collaborative usage. And this is our current uh, development a little bit. So this is not our work. These are uh, pictures from the internet. Just to give you an idea what we are working currently on is a fully distributed TN and mixed reality collaboration. That means where we have a full mixture of virtual objects, real objects, synthetic objects, digital twins, as well as virtual and real persons being either in situ or distributed, which is quite a huge research agenda for the next years to come. And of course, we are not the only ones to work in that domain. All right, so I just skip that here because it's too much. And I thank you very much for being patient for so long, for almost an hour um, on my talk here. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks a lot.